everyone here today to our seminar with or workshop uh, historian talk with Aston Gonzalez. Um, I'm Kate Maser, and with Greg Downs, we are moderating a series of talks this fall, uh, sponsored by the Journal of the Civil War Era, which we both edit. And so before I turn it over to our conversation with Aston, I want to introduce the remaining uh, two additional seminars, workshops, talks that we'll be having this fall. Um, we're following on a really, what we felt was a really successful summer series of talks where we spoke with historians about their work, uh, both recent books and kind of longstanding bodies of work. And we wanted to continue that into the fall during a time when it's sometimes hard to connect with one another or when conferences are canceled or online. And we wanted to give um, some opportunities for people to come together and hear about new work and new projects. And so we're continuing that into the fall. Um, so we have today's event with Dr. Aston Gonzalez, and then the next event will be Friday, October 30th at 4 p.m. Eastern. We're having a round table with the 19th century governor's paper. So we'll have representatives from three different Civil War and Reconstruction governor's papers projects, one at, out of University or yeah, out of Kentucky, one out of Mississippi, and one out of Alabama. And participants in these Civil War governor and Reconstruction governor's papers projects will be sharing their insights about um, collecting those papers, archiving them, and um, digitizing many of them, and what new kinds of uh, discoveries they're finding in the archives, what new kinds of resources may be available for researchers. And the participants in that are Patrick Lewis at the Filson Historical Society, Charles Welsko at Kentucky Historical Society, Leslie Gordon at University of Alabama, Julia Brock at University of Alabama, Susanna Ural at University of Southern Mississippi, and Stephanie Seal Walters at George Mason University. So we'll have a big panel discussion with them on Friday, October 30th. And then on December 3rd, we'll host Dr. Alexandra Finley, the author of the newly published book, An Intimate Economy, Enslaved Women, Work, and America's Domestic Slave Trade. So another um, new book on the Civil War era, and we're very much looking forward to speaking with her. You can find information about all of these talks on the Journal of the Civil War Era's blog. It's called Muster. And if you Google Muster Journal of the Civil War Era, you'll find it. And you'll also find links there to all of our talks from last summer, um, which will, those links take you to uh, the YouTube, our YouTube page. So that is a separate uh, Journal of the Civil War Era YouTube page where we're archiving uh, the, the recordings of all these talks for people to watch later. So um, I think that's it by way of introduction. We're going to uh, talk with Aston for about 40 minutes and then we're going to take questions from you all in the audience. And so uh, you'll see that at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. And if you, if and when you wanna ask a question, you can just type it in there and we will see your questions and be able to try to pose them to Dr. Gonzalez and, uh, and have him answer them. So we're, you can feel free to ask the questions anytime and we'll get to them in kind of the second half of this event. So Greg, over to you. All right, well, thank you so much, Kate. And I wanna welcome and thank uh, Dr. Aston Gonzalez. I'll uh, briefly introduce him and uh, then we'll go into our first questions uh, about primarily focusing upon his, uh, his just published book. Originally from San Antonio, Texas, Dr. Gonzalez is a scholar of 19th century African-American history, politics, and visual culture. He's an associate professor of history at Salisbury University, and he teaches African-American and U.S. history there. He graduated with his PhD from the University of Michigan, and his first book, Visualizing Equality, African-American Rights and Visual Culture in the 19th Century, was just published in the John Hope Franklin series in African-American History and Culture by the University of North Carolina Press. It studies the lives of black activists who produced and circulated images to advance numerous black rights campaigns in the middle decades of the 19th century, as well as the reception and uses of those images by those who viewed and collected them. He has forthcoming and published articles about African-American portraiture after the American Revolution, the creation of African-American archives, the visual representation of escaped slaves, and the visual production of free black abolitionists, and has presented at dozens of conferences and at dozens of conferences. He's currently working on a book project on black genius and the science of race during the long 19th century. So Aston, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm, so I'm very honored to, to be in conversation with all of you today. 
Oh, well, we're delighted that you're here. Um, the first, I wanted to just do a little uh, scene setting for people. Um, one of the things, it's really a joyous book to read uh, and to view an amazing number of, of images and a tribute to the idea that history presses, in your case, UNC Press, uh, which of course we all think highly of, um, but uh, you know, are willing to do high quality, uh, multiple high quality images. Um, and uh, it studies the producers of those images, um, including a wide range of interesting figures, Robert Douglas, Patrick Henry Reason, Augustus Washington, as well as the panoramas of James Presley, William Wells Brown, and Henry Box Brown, and their reception. And before we go into some of the, the many arguments you make about that production, its technology, and the reception, and the way that changes over time, I wonder if you'd step back a bit and for more textually oriented historians, uh, which I suspect most historians of the Civil War era remain, to talk a little bit about what you see as so exciting and promising about the study of visual culture and what it means to treat images not as illustrations, as all too many of us, including me, fall into, um, but as sources that can really be read in productive and dynamic ways. Thank you. So I think one of the, the powers of, of images has to do with the context that they're produced in. And I think uh, a lot of scholarship has already been written about how images can not only uh, represent these uh, very powerful conversations and discourses that are occurring um, at the time of the, the creation of these images, but also how images can, um, can demonstrate how people are grappling with major issues. So especially if we're thinking about the Civil War era and the decades before, um, there are these, these debates raging about abolitionism, right? The, context, the contours and the textures of, of the anti-slavery movement really give um, these opportunities for African Americans and white allies to create images that, um, that speak to the issues that are most important to them. And more broadly, I think images are a way for, for scholars, historians included, to think about how people uh, give meaning to their lives. What do they create? Why do they create it? How do people um, collect, uh, notate sometimes these images? How do, they, um, how do they circulate them among their friends, their peers, among strangers? So it's, it's, there are a lot of parallels, I think, in the way that we think about the, the circulation of literature, of, of texts, um, in, the, in the form of speeches or pamphlets. Uh, books, for example, that um, mirror the way that people create and collect images. And so I think we can understand them similarly as historical objects, but then they do something a little bit different, right? There are, um, there's certainly uh, an area of, of interpretation that is made possible by images in much the same way that the text does that as well. But images are um, a way for people to to, to understand the, the places that they live, the, the issues that they deal with every day. And we can think of, uh, for example, portraiture as a way of uh, providing an example of this. A lot of individuals during the Civil War era collect family photos for the first time, right? They're, they're able to put carte de visites together in a bound family photo album, right? Their, their family members, their friends, individuals they've never met before, for, right, uh, such as figures like President Abraham Lincoln. Um, but we can see how people value, how they can um, sort of make meaning from these objects and they, they can use images to, to better situate um, their, their life experience. That's great. I'm going to um, just follow up briefly and then Kate will, uh, Kate will ask the next question. Um, so the First, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, well, if you could talk about two interrelated questions. How did you come to develop your own proficiency in reading images? Um, and for those scholars who are more trained in or rooted in texts and are interested, image curious, but are, you know, wary or, or you know, um, not confident, what would be the ways that you would recommend they start other than reading your book and other fine works of uh, history of visual culture? Um, that they start sharpening their own skills because we all live and work. We we you know we we study a period where there's a real 
bounty of images, many of which we only use, many of which many scholars, not you, only use to a, a minimal amount in terms of their potential? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there are several resources that, that anybody can turn to, especially scholars of the Civil War era and, and before. Um, so I, for example, attended an NEH summer uh, program that focused on the visual culture of the Civil War. So this was, uh, and now this material is available online, the syllabus as well as, um, right, some of the readings are available. This is run through CUNY, right, the CUNY Graduate Center. So that's one place for, to, for folks to go and where I went to gain training in this, this area of visual culture, especially of the Civil War era but also uh, places like the American Antiquarian Society. They have a, a Center for Historic um, Visual Culture, right? This is CHAVIC, that's the, that's the acronym, that every summer focuses on a particular period and a subject that um, takes at its focus, at, at its center, images and how people are understanding images to influence political com campaigns, how they influence the way that people uh, understand race, and, and gender, right? These are, these are main topics, uh, broad topics, that these centers and these, these archives um, have, have helped train me in. I attended Chavik also several, many years ago now. Um, so that was, that was really helpful. It, it also put me in touch with a lot of individuals who are asking the same kinds of questions, right? How can images be used as sources? How can they uh, elucidate something new and different that a speech might not necessarily. And importantly, how do you pair images and text together so that you can get this, this really uh, great kind of friction sometimes between the information that they both convey to perhaps reveal some kind of historical truth that um, each source independently might not reveal. So there's, there's a lot here um, that's already available at the archives of, um, that are here in the United States that, that can provide some insight into this. I'd be remiss, of course, too, if I didn't mention the Library Company of Philadelphia, which has an amazing um, number of staff, and, of staff members who are um, constantly archiving materials and making them accessible uh, using online exhibitions, as many other archives do. And those folks have helped me at the Library Company. Um, I've, I've been there a couple of times as a fellow in the program of African American history, that, um, that they've really helped open my eyes. They've not only showed me these visual materials, sometimes for the first time, right? I, I couldn't find them online. Um, I couldn't find them uh, even sort of using their amazingly useful databases, but rather these archivists, right? Sending them an email, asking them what kinds of materials have recently been acquired. They will point you to these, to these sources. And I promise that um, that you will learn something new um, every time that you, you look at these sources. So um, it, was a, it was me going to these different archives and, and holding fellowships at some of them that really helped open my eyes and, and allowed me to train myself, but also allowed experts uh, to be in the room with me and um, sort of pointed out the methodological and the theoretical um, the stakes that are, that are present there when using these kinds of historical objects as primary sources. Um, that's such a great segue into something I wanted to ask about. So, I mean, because your book really beautifully combines reading visual images as texts. So you spend a lot more time. I mean, I think part of what Greg is implying is, you know, you don't put an image and sort of give a caption like this, this portrait of so-and-so, but it's like, here's, here's some things we could read into this about what this is conveying. And then you sort of really do a model job of combining that kind of analysis of the image with analysis of associated texts. So whether it's talking about the lives and careers of the individual artists or producers of these images and the context that they lived in. Um, so you're really filling out the picture. Um, and I got the sense reading the introduction to your book that, you know, it's sort of um, the opposite of what's sometimes called formalism, where you just look at an image and you, you read it without, you know, having, a, you, you sort of deliberately block out context. Yours is a fully contextualized kind of reading of these images. Um, and so I just wanted to bring up, you know, begin to talk about some of the specifics in your book. I mean, one of the things, because you're one of the central thrusts of your book is these images and the producers of these images that you're talking about 
were, they were political, they were engaging in politics of racial equality um, in a variety of different ways. And so you're, you're not really talking about their views on how to paint a landscape unless it's uh, you know, connected to some aspect of um, visions of what the world should look like in a, in a kind of more public and political way. And I guess I wanted to hear you talk a little bit, uh, there's a dialogue throughout the book of um, a lot of these black artists are responding to racist representations of African Americans. Um, and so you have, it's only a tiny number in the, in the voluminous number of illustrations in your book, you have only a few that are these kind of racist caricatures. And you use them in the book to demonstrate the climate in which black artists were operating and to, to kind of contrast the kinds of imagery that African-American artists were producing with these racist caricatures that were coming out of places like Philadelphia and New York. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that. I think most people who are attending right now probably haven't yet had a chance to read your book. So you know, feel free to give us some examples of how that dialogue worked and what those black artists were doing. Right, so I think there are exponentially more racist and racial caricatures of African Americans and other people of color in the 19th century than those created by black artists during the period I, in, in which I write or about which I write. Um, and I didn't re really want to, to um, provide too many of those in the, in the text itself because I think that would overshadow, right? The, the racial caricatures would overshadow some of the work that these uh, image makers were creating. But I think it's important too, as you mentioned, Kate, to, um, to think about these individuals as activists, right? These are um, individuals who are part of anti-slavery uh, organizations. They're the ones who are actually attending some of these colored conventions, as they were called in the 19th century, to try to advance black rights campaigns, to push for black public education, to support uh, the right to vote for uh, black men during the, um, during the Civil War and after the Civil War, right? So I think the, the images here that I'm, I'm using are really, um, they're made in the context of, and sometimes made immediately in response to these racist caricatures that are circulating uh, very broadly and very quickly in American culture during the 19th century. So uh, for example, Patrick, uh, Patrick Henry Reason is a free black man. He's born in New York City, and he creates a number of frontispieces that are included at the beginnings of escaped slave narratives that are published in the 1830s and 40s. And he's really interested in trying to make sure that these, uh, these men who, uh, whose, whose books he's, he's um, right, creating these frontispieces for, that they are seen as intelligent and capable individuals. And in fact, the, the idea of, of representing them in very formal clothing with, um, right, with, with perfectly uh, coiffed hair and um, sort of very middle class or upper class clothing on, right, that that clashes with the kinds of stereotypes that are circulating in American culture at this time. So people who are picking up this book, those who are interested in the anti-slavery cause generally, or right, as uh, sort of newcomers to this idea of Garrisonian abolitionism, they're gonna pick up this book and they might expect the kinds of images of enslaved people that are so rampant during the 1830s and 40s, but yet when they open up this, when they open up this book, the short uh, escaped slave narrative, they see a very respectable individual who looks like he could belong in any city, any town in the United States, and he would belong to a kind of class, right, a, a socioeconomic class based on his, his clothing, his demeanor, and these other kinds of elements of portraiture that are so well known at this time. Um, and so these kinds of ideas about how people look um, as a way of representing their interiority, right, their intelligence, their leadership potential, their, as I describe in the book, their manliness, right, their, their masculinity, right, this all clashes with the kinds of images that are so um, so uh, derisive in, in this period. And if we think too about the kinds of images that are um, produced, the, the, the daguerreotypes that are produced by Augustus Washington, who is a, also a free black man, who is actually from Trenton, New Jersey, but um, moves to Hartford, Connecticut before moving to uh, Monrovia, Liberia, right? He's sending back images, daguerreotypes, as well as, um, right, these daguerreotypes are created into uh, created into, uh, they're put into newspaper form as woodcuts, right? They depict black politicians in Liberia. Augustus 
Washington is, is photographing individuals who are Liberian senators, vice presidents, right, uh, secretaries of state, as a way of demonstrating what is possible for black people in the United States. Right? And again, these images of very respectable black politicians, elected, democratically elected black politicians, clashes with the kinds of really uh, sort of disgusting racist caricature that so many Americans are seeing during the uh, 1840s and 50s and certainly before and, and after, sadly. So these, these individuals are, are invested not only in, in advancing these different political campaigns, whether it be emigration in the case of Augustus Washington or advancing free black voting rights as Patrick Henry Reason does, or um, right, trying to secure freedom, like absolute freedom for black people, free and enslaved. Right, that's the work that, that Reason does and also a free black Philadelphian, Robert Douglas Jr. So these individuals are interested in the, um, the ways that their, their images are used and collected, how they challenge people's ideas um, about race, about black people in particular. And the great thing I think uh, that, that readers will find in this book is that I have evidence of how people respond to these images and, and that's, that took a very long time to find. That's probably the most difficult part of this project because how often do we uh, read um, in the 19th century about people reflecting on the images that they've purchased or the images that they see in books or in newspapers, right? As, as well as I could, I documented examples of where people encountered these images and what it made them think about. And then they recorded those responses in text. Right, in newspaper articles, in op-eds, right, the equivalent of op-eds. Editors of newspapers would also write about um, their responses to these escaped slave narratives. So right, this is, I think, a really fascinating project in part because it documents the kind of activism that Black people are a part of, but it also gets at the reception of that, right? how people actually understand these images and how they grapple with them and the ideas contained within them and communicated by them during this, these middle decades of the 19th century. That's a great answer. And I'm sure we're gonna to return to some pieces of it. <clears throat> Before we got um, too deeply into some of those, I wondered if it also would be helpful to show people, to slow down with a uh, more intimate um, image uh, that you also uh, read very carefully and in a very interesting way, which is the Friendship Album of Marianne Dickerson. Um, and uh, I was really struck in talking about um, Douglas, uh, Robert Douglas in that chapter to see uh, the, A, I kind of wanted to know how, you know, what, what got you onto the Friendship Album? And then B, um, you know, if, uh, you know, how you or, you know, came to think about the many different ways that you could utilize a, a source like this. So my guess is some of our, our viewers will want you to first describe uh, what a friendship album is and what, you know, uh, Marianne Dickerson's friendship album is. Um, and then, uh, you know, to the degree, uh, you know, you, you, you haven't run out of breath to, uh, you know, keep going and to talk a little bit about uh, you know, what you can do, we, you, we can do with this as uh, scholars and, uh, you know, how you, your process of figuring that out. Sure. So the, even the name uh, Friendship Album, the phrase is maybe deceptively simple because it's a, it's a source. These are common in the, the 18th century and the 19th century. Uh, these are albums effectively that uh, usually young women would be gifted by other female members of their their family or perhaps uh, female friends. And this friendship album was a way for the, the young girl, usually a uh, teenager often, to, to circulate um, the album to her friends and allow them to, to leave their mark, so to speak, to, um, to, to include a poem or an image or uh, some kind of inclusion by which the album owner would be able to remember their friend by. So often what we get during the, um, the late 18th century and the early 19th century are these friendship albums curated um, not by the individuals who own the albums necessarily, but by their friends and by their family members who are given these friendship albums and leave, uh, leave their mark. So the, the friendship albums that are held 
Uh, one of them is at the Moreland Spingern there at Howard University. And the others that I know of are, are held at the Library Company of Philadelphia. And these, these four collectively are owned by African American women. And what's fantastic about them is that they are uh, documents that are circulated not over the course of a week or two weeks or a month or a year, but sometimes over the course of decades. And so the Dickerson albums um, that are held at the, and the, the, the Cassie album, the three of them total that are held at the Library Company of Philadelphia, they record the kinds of um, the networks, the friendship networks, but also the political networks that these black women are a part of. And so one of the reasons that I know about this, the main reason I know about these, uh, these sources is that Mary Kelly, one of my advisors in graduate school, uh, told me about them. And she said, you know, the, the kind of work that you're interested in, the visual material plus the, uh, the gendered aspects of activism, right? Um, with respect to men and women, right? The gendered aspects of, act, of activism and anti-slavery work is here. They're there in the albums. And they had only recently been acquired by the Library Company of Philadelphia at that point. And so I know several other scholars uh, like Jasmine Cobb have, have really placed these these albums at the center of, of their research. And it's, it's a fascinating way of tracing how people interact with one another, what they think is important, right? Because they, these, these inclusions are typically only one, maybe two pages long per person, right? Per friend or ally or um, family member who is given this, this album to, to leave their mark in. So what's, what's fascinating about the Dickerson albums is that we have you know, William Lloyd Garrison, we eventually have um, Frederick Douglass, we have a number of, of black and white men and women um, politicians and, and uh, activists who are leaving their mark in, these, in these, uh, these friendship albums. And I think one of the ways that this lends sort of strength to my project is that black activists like Robert Douglas Jr. and also even Patrick Henry Reason leave their image. Um, they, for example, the, the image, one of the two images on the, the cover of my book is created by Robert Douglas Jr. His is the, the pen and ink wash uh, drawing of the Boo Room Slave, which is a, a reference to a story about an enslaved woman who escapes her captors and she prays vigorously for deliverance from them as they try to capture her, right? As they're searching for her. So um, what's fascinating about this, this story is the way that Robert Douglas Jr. not only uh, creates this watercolor drawing or this, this watercoloring, um, uh, watercolor painting of this image, but then he, he pairs it with a, a poem from a, 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 an 18th century poem that describes the kind of brutality that slavery and slave owners represent. So um, again, sort of getting back to one of the, the first questions about how I read these images in, in conjunction with text. What we have in, in the, uh, the Dickerson albums and, and other friendship albums is the way, is sort of insight into the way that these black activists are using images and trying to not only convey messages to the owner of the album, but then certainly all the people who are going to be looking through this album after it is returned to the individual, right, who owns it. Because these images, right, these images that are contained within these books, they are in amazing condition and they travel for decades to these other people in Philadelphia, in Boston, in Washington, DC, it, it, right? It's, it's remarkable to, to think of these objects as traveling mementos that convey uh, political messages and messages of friendship and, uh, and female friendship in particular to, um, to these individuals. So these are rich sources that I think are, are going to be paying dividends to scholars for a very, very long time to come. Um, thank you so much for that. So I first want to remind our, our participants to um, feel free to go ahead and um, ask questions, use the Q&A button, uh, and we would love to hear your questions or your thoughts from the specific, you know, questions about individual people that Aston wrote about to questions about methodology or historiography or, you know, any of the above. Um, so go ahead and do that and we will, uh, you know, take those on and filter and, and ask them. Um, my next question 
Well, I have two and I'm, they're warring inside my head. One is, I just would love to hear you discuss because I loved reading about it, the moving panoramas. I would like to hear you talk about what those were and then the particular story of William Walls Brown seeing a particular one and then deciding that he had to make his own. So if that be, and, but just to kind of capture for us, uh, I think one of the things that's interesting about 19th century um, visual culture, thinking about things like photography, carte de visite, these uh, moving panoramas, the kind of light shows, is there are a lot of things that feel very modern and kind of relatable from our own time, but yet it was so very different. And so I would love to, for the people who are here to hear about the moving panoramas. Um, yeah, so let, I'll just leave it there. Sure, so, um, so just a little bit more background too. My, my chapters move chronologically, but also they, they generally track with the different kinds of visual technologies that are invented and used and really seized by African-American um, activists here uh, in the middle decades of the 19th century. So I begin with, with engravings, there are a few daguerreotypes, and then I move into the middle of the, the book by writing about these moving panoramas. And I think some of, uh, some of our viewers probably know uh, the panorama generally, the stationary panorama very well, uh, right? It's typically a scene that's painted um, on a very, very large wall and attendees go in and they see a, a huge view of um, a battle or of a scene from uh, sort of a vantage point overlooking a valley or uh, some kind of awe-inspiring uh, majestic landscape or, or scene. But the moving panorama is a little bit different, right? It, it had actually been created in the late 18th century and then it's revived in the, in the 1840s in the United States, right? It becomes this popular visual medium by which people learn about, and a lot of folks have written about this, like Martha Sandweiss, for example, They've, they learn about the West. They think about the, um, they think about westward expansion in the, uh, in the sort of visual medium of the moving panorama, which is effectively a, a huge plane of canvas that is stretched taut between two moving cylinders so that at any given point, there is a, there's a scene that's uh, viewed in front of um, the audience, and then the scene moves away and is sort of um, is spun around into one of these cylinders, and the next view is shown, right? And it's backlit, usually by um, a bonfire, which is kind of terrifying, <laughs> uh, because these take place indoors. And usually it's quite dark inside, so that the, the, the images and the, the scenes really pop with the, with, the, um, with the bonfire back behind, uh, or illuminated lanterns sometimes if people are trying to be safe. Um, and so typically there are anywhere between 50 and 150 people who view these moving panoramas in these interior spaces. And what's fascinating about this chapter is that in the 1850s, in the very early 1850s, there are four African-American men, three of whom I detail uh, in, this, in this chapter of mine. There are these African-American activists who say to themselves, the moving panorama is actually an excellent opportunity. It's a visual medium that is popular and that people are attending in, in mass numbers. Um, we need to, to not just think about landscapes and you know, views of the Mississippi River or views of uh, the, the at the Pacific coastline, right? We need to, to change the views that are offered to audience members, men, women, and children, and instead show them scenes of slavery so that we can change this, this format into one that is laden with, political, with a political agenda, right? Trying to convince individuals that slavery is actually uh, detrimental and, and, and horrific for not just enslaved people, but for the entire United States. So as you mentioned, Kate, uh, William Wells Brown is one of these individuals. There's also Henry Box Brown and James Presley Ball. Um, and the first two of these men that I mentioned are formerly enslaved men. And it's when William Wells Brown actually attends one of these moving panoramas uh, that's created by and, and, and toured by John Banford, right? This uh, very, very successful moving panorama um, uh, sort of businessman. I mean, he becomes fabulously wealthy because of it, right? Something like a quarter million uh, dollars is, is earned, right? And this is in the, the late 1840s by just ticket sales from this moving panorama, right? And William Wells Brown attends. 
and he realizes that the views of the Mississippi are actually horribly inaccurate. Uh, Banford actually, you know, helps to construct these images that very much sideline, they push to the, to the periphery, literally and metaphorically, enslaved people and the system of slavery. And in fact, in some images, in some of the scenes that are backlit by these, by these fires or these lanterns, right, the, the, the narrator of these uh, moving panoramas describes these romantic scenes of sugarcane plantations in Mississippi and in Louisiana, right? And how um, slave owners in these places maintain these elaborate, gorgeous estates, right? These plantations are beautiful places that um, in their descriptions don't include the kind of brutality and violence that enslaved people um, experience. And so William Wells Brown, this formerly enslaved man, realizes that he needs to change the narrative, the visual narrative, as well as that which is prevented, uh, uh, rather um, provided for individuals. Right? He helps to, to publish a, a pamphlet that goes along with his moving panorama that describes the scenes. Because unfortunately, and this is one of the, the, the methodological issues that I had to grapple with when writing this book, the moving panoramas I write about don't exist. Right? There are only a, a very small handful of moving panoramas that do exist, uh, that survived, you know, 150, 160 years, despite the fact that there were dozens created during this, this groundswell of popularity during the late 1840s and early 1850s of them. So William Wells Brown is really trying to give audiences, as he describes it, the kind of truth about slavery, right? He says that there's no way that he can accurately describe the entire institution of slavery but he knows that his moving panorama can actually provide men, women, and children who attend these moving panoramas some truth about the, 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 the brutalities, right? Men and women being separated right, from their children, people being whipped, people being, um, being forced to labor in these, uh, these horrific conditions, right? And he shows that, he shows that to people who attend his moving panorama. And he not only brings it to those who are, um, in Boston, but he also travels with it across the Atlantic. He and uh, Henry Box Brown display their mov moving panoramas of slavery in the British Isles, right? In Scotland, in England, um, in Wales. It's remarkable how they're trying to spread news of this uh, horrific institution of slavery and even gain money, right? They're trying to raise money for the anti-slavery cause here in the United States. So there are a lot of different ways that I've, uh, I've used these, uh, these historical sources that detail these moving panoramas, despite not having been able to see them for myself. But I can, I can tell um, the kind of content that they, they conveyed because of these kinds of sources like pamphlets, descriptive pamphlets of every scene that um, these, these moving panorama purveyors leave behind. And you did such a good job with that. I mean, just given that the, the artifacts themselves, the art itself no longer exists. Um, and I just want to say before Greg jumps in with the next question, I mean, it's just so interesting to me that these were moving images. They're not film, they're not, you know, movies, but it just sort of um, fits to me with discussions over time about the power of moving images, the relationship of film to slavery, more recent things like 12 Years a Slave and also kind of violent representations of, of violence against African-Americans that circulate now and the kind of ways in which those are really complicated, um, you know, kind of to see and the power, basically the power of moving images. And so I was, that's one thing that really struck me when reading about those moving panoramas. Um, so anyway, I, I found that really resonant. Back over to Greg. Thanks so much. Um, one of, we've got a couple of questions that have come in on the Q&A function. I saw a participant raise hand. We can't call on participants because of the nature of the security that we use, but if you type questions into the Q&A box, um, we will aim soon to start uh, transitioning over to those. So any questions, please use the Q&A function. And uh, we've got two in already and, and I hope more coming. <clears throat> So Aston, A, I wanted to just echo uh, Kate's uh, 
interest or uh, you know admiration for the challenge, especially for a historian of describing something you know you'll never get to see. And it made me think of uh, you know something that I teach in some of my classes, Ada Ferrer's efforts with Aponte, and the ways that different scholars of uh, Cuba have wrestled with the problem of how to deal, in this case, with lengthy descriptions, um, but no visual representation of, a, of, of what's a visual source and, and, and what happens as people treat those descriptions as text and what happens as Ferrer does is they treat, try and reconstruct at least a sort of set of visual images from them. So it's really a, a, a fun and interesting thing, you know, piece to read just as an exercise of the historical imagination. But I also realized that in, uh, because the uh, you know, topics are so fascinating and the images are so powerful, we've dived into uh, you know, some of the images and, and neglected to do something we usually you know, offer people a chance to do right at the start. And that's just to uh, you know, sum up your, your overall argument. So I, I didn't want to uh, you know, suddenly get to the end and realize we had deprived you of that. Some of it's implicit in the claims that you're making and 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 so you can decide how uh, you know how sweeping you want to be but i did want to give you that chance just to tell readers what is what do these pieces add up to in your formulation yeah so that's thank you for that i think um this book is really about african-american activists and how they used images to try to advance different black rights campaigns during the middle decades of the 19th century and what we see is that um, they use these visual technologies as they're created sometimes to, um, to appeal to as many people as possible. They really seize on these, uh, these visual media as a way of trying to uh, bring to larger audiences and different audiences these arguments that African Americans should have equal rights in terms of being free from slavery, of having uh, voting rights, of being able to be uh, elected politicians during and after the Civil War. So there are, there are a lot of different arguments that are being made by these, these Black activists outside of their images. But when we include their images as well, we, and we layer this kind of um, historical source base, one on top of the other, we can really see that, um, that this book expands the way that um, political arguments take shape and how they unfolded and how they reach different audiences during this time. And so it's really when we layer those kinds of images with the kinds of civic activities that these um, individuals are a part of, right, that their, their anti-slavery work, their attempts to, to advance uh, Black voting rights after the Civil War, you know, campaigns to include Black men in the Union Army, right, that these, uh, this elucidates how individuals really task themselves with producing and disseminating knowledge about Blackness that really challenge these kinds of racial, uh, these dominant racial stereotypes of Black people. And so they really try to intend, these artists intend and did diligently work to achieve the, the sweeping kinds of social change resulting from um, the internalization of the messages that they're, that they're producing. So, you know, they're grappling with these issues of, of anti-slavery, how best to, to undertake that, um, whether emigration to Haiti is a good idea or to, to Liberia, right? They're grappling with the Fugitive Slave Act and Black Mil Civil War military service, um, as well as the growth of the AME church. So these individuals are really staking out their their positions. And I think the book really encourages us to reimagine the 19th century production and consumption of print and visual culture. So these individuals are, are very much interested in trying to advance their campaigns. And they're demonstrating this, this possibility for what Black people can do and what they can be in this, this, newly, uh, this new landscape of the United States, especially as the Civil War unfolds and, and uh, transitions into Reconstruction. Thanks so much for that kind of encapsulation of what, your, of what the project is kind of doing. And um, I want to, at, before we wrap up, which we're not doing any time in very soon, but we want to definitely get into the kind of post-Civil War uh, moment. But one, I want to, uh, there's a question that came in that kind of speaks to something that I was also um, going to ask about. Um, and the way that the person put the question is, um, 
studio portraits, which um, you do talk about portraits of individuals as well, studio portraits tend to reinforce uh, the emphasis on the individual or sometimes the individual embedded in a respectable family, while your descriptions of friendship albums show how activist networks can develop around visual culture and your description of displays of moving panoramas, evidence mass, public consumption of politicized images. So is there a deeper lesson here about whether our the love for individualism and how we tell history erases the kind of activist networking or mass education that your examples offer? And I would just, you know, kind of add to that or encourage you to talk about those networks. There's a lot in your book about like Philadelphia in particular or some stuff about New York City. But another striking thing is the networks that cross lines. So you have people going from um, Philadelphia to New York or you have, well, that's not that far, but you have people after the Civil War going from Cincinnati to Mississippi. Um, you talk about Edward Thomas, who I have written about, not as a um, person writing about uh, trying to create an, a black art exhibit, but as you know, one of the members of the delegation that went to Abraham Lincoln. But you know, there are these networks of people, they know each other. And I feel like one of the benefits of writing about art and artists is that you're capturing a world that is not visible when you only look at the most kind of the, the traditional, more uh, widely known black abolitionists. So yeah, so just talk more about networks and kind of these, the ways that these, um, that your work illuminates relationships among people, if you would. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question about uh, relating the individual to these, these larger political networks, because that's one of the, the beautiful things about the, the friendship albums. They sort of make real and make visible, to pardon the pardon the pun, uh, these kinds of networks. How people know each other and and right, what kinds of messages they are explicitly conveying to one another. And I think the the person who asked the question about the the portrait and portraiture generally being about the individual and uh, you know right that sometimes being a roadblock to understanding right how that individual is uh, is part of a larger network. I think really explains how, um, how I, I rely on text quite a lot. I, I stick very closely to um, the, the, what the text says. I don't deviate much at all from uh, these, these textual representations of how people know each other, right? There's, there's very, very little speculation about what the images mean in this, in this book because what I'm, I'm, and I'm thankful for this, there are enough textual connections that are made between newspaper articles, letters between individuals, uh, sometimes court cases that link individuals together that I, I don't need to, or I, I shouldn't and I won't, uh, speculate what the images mean and how they're related to the individual. But the, the friendship albums are great because they have these images embedded within them that help to explain how individuals thought about slavery, how they thought about uh, women's education and specifically black women's education, um, how, how botany, for example, and here I'm thinking about the, the work of Jess Linker, um, Jessica Linker, that this is, a, um, this is a way for scholars to really understand how, um, how images can trace these, uh, with the, with, in, in combination rather, with, with text, how they can trace this, this lineage of ideas and these, these connections between individuals very, very closely in ways that just putting images one next to the other just can't do. So um, another thing that I think is, is illustrative of this point and, and answers the question fairly well is the way that individuals keep family albums, photo family albums. And this is what I cover a little bit more in my last chapter, in the last chapter of my book, because um, th this, this is a, a, rel a relatively new way for scholars to think about how uh, people organize their families and how they um, sort of take in images from people, friends and, and people they don't even know and incorporate them into their family photo albums. And we can actually glean from the, the organization of these family albums these, or these image albums, who is important, why they are important. Um, I do this with the Ball family. It's, it's very difficult uh, because of the, the lack of remaining images in this, this family photo album, but there are names written at the bottoms of these, uh, these pages where uh, people's photos had once been. So uh, there's a way of trying to pair text and image together so that they, they reveal something new 
about the way that individuals are thinking about um, the, the freedom the, the freedom that comes along with the end of slavery, right? When people incorporate images of, of Frederick Douglass, who they've never met before, in their family photo albums, or, right, we can see images of, of Abraham Lincoln in these family photo albums as well. So there's a way that we can get at the kinds of conversations or the ideas that are important to individuals in a very intimate setting, like a family photo album or like a friendship album that at once is, is very personal, very intimate, but also has these much broader connections to conversations and events that are taking place well outside, well outside of the family that, um, that the album documents. That's great. Thanks so much. We're going to be pulling some more questions from the Q&A. Uh, if anyone else wants to submit, uh, we've got several, but if anyone else wants to utilize the Q&A function. Uh, I'm going to pull a question from Evie uh, Toronto asking, uh, you know, about how to understand the challenges of the archive, sometimes especially in the aftermath of a, of a well of a gracefully written and narrated project like yours, uh, it can seem inevitable, right? And of course, we all know that in the process it's not, and there are some particular challenges in dealing with these kind of archives that art historians have long wrestled with and that uh, historians are, are now wrestling with. So can you help us to understand especially the challenges uh, for scholars trying to reconstruct a Black experience um, as they think about both the sort of intentional and the accidental omissions that get built into the kind of archives that they're trying to work with? Oh, that's the million dollar question, to be honest. Uh, there are a lot of uh, roadblocks and dead ends that I, that I found in my research because there was simply no source base that I could turn to that could answer my research questions. Um, one thing that I, I really tried to do throughout, especially the first chapters of this book, is to think about the ways, and also the, the moving panorama um, chapter, um, is the ways that Black women are part of this story, right? That the ways that even though they're not image makers, none that I've found anyway, in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, they're part of that process, right? And that's one of the reasons why I brought in these friendship albums, not only because they had been uh, created, uh, by, or not created, but not only because some of the images left in them had been created by these Black photographers and engravers, but also because these are women Right, who are facilitating the movement of these ideas. These are black women, these are white women who are leaving their, um, leaving their poems, leaving their messages, leaving their images, leaving their, their uh, sort of uh, their tips about how to lead a, a religious and a moral and a good life and how to be a good mother sometimes. Right? This is what's left in these friendship albums. And that's really important to me too because it's, it's not, my book is not just about, right, politics, politics, politics. It's about the, the very, the fine grained nature of friendship and how people create these connections between one another and really how these images are something of extensions that these activist artists create to try to convince readers and viewers that um, black people deserve the kinds of rights that these images convey. So uh, getting at those, those individual stories is sometimes very difficult, right? I think the, the person who wrote the question is, a, is, is well attuned to the, the kinds of source limitations. But I think that the, the sources or the source bases, the archives that um, I'm working with, right, can be maneuvered in such a way that um, highlight in these, these flashpoints the, the voices and the experiences of women, of African Americans, of sometimes even slave owners, right? There are a few mentions of, of slave owners in my, in my book that are taken with these images that they see of Black people and, and William Lloyd Garrison. Sometimes they're uh, very offended by the, the images that they see, and other times they make them question. These images make them question. The, the institution that they are a part of and that they support. So these, these archival limitations, I'll give you one example here. Um, again, I've mentioned that the, the moving panoramas that I write about no longer ex exist, not that I can find anyway. And please, if somebody finds them, uh, write a lot about them. <laughs> they're incredibly rich and powerful sources. Uh, and the context as I write about in this, in this fourth chapter of my book really, I think, explains that and makes that case um, 
makes that case clear. But one of the one of the problems I faced too was the fact that a number of, of portraits and also landscape paintings by Robert Douglas Jr. during his time in Haiti, when he goes there for more than a year to document Haitian leadership, right? The possibilities of black leadership, the possibilities of black independence, and the possibilities of black freedom, right? These are no longer extant that I can find. So again, if somebody can find them, please uh, let me know and also write about them yourself. But um, right, I can't see these, I haven't been able to see these images, but I have descriptions of them. And I, I know that Douglas spoke about them, right? There are newspaper articles and advertisements of him, of his, that detail how he goes to one of the prominent black churches in Philadelphia, right? This is St. Thomas. And he gives lectures about his time in Haiti. He teaches people, he charges them admission, but he allows children to come in, for, uh, sometimes for free, to hear this uh, information about Haiti and about the kinds of life that are possible for Black people. And this is coming at a time when there's been a lot of discussion about in Philadelphia, among members of the Black community there, about, is this a good idea? Is, is emigration, is voluntary emigration to the Caribbean a good idea, right? For a, a moment, there was agreement that this was a good idea, but it was very quickly, um, right? Individuals very quickly came to the, to the opposite conclusion. But this kind of um, problem that, that I've encountered in the, in the archives is in part solved by what I describe as triangulation, right? It's a way of understanding that uh, a particular, there might be a, a, a minor roadblock, but there are other ways of getting at, of triangulating that information by turning to other types of sources, whether they be court cases, as I use in one of my chapters, um, or newspaper advertisements, or letters that Douglas has written home. Um, and I've been very lucky that I've had uh, a number of archivists who've reached out to me and helped me find these letters and find these documents, because they understand that they are very difficult uh, to locate. And uh, it sometimes just takes a lot of time and uh, sometimes a lot of luck to, to, to find this, this material. So that was a great question. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that um, explanation and really kind of thinking through and talking through some of the strategies to deal with those absences while also trying to pursue a really interesting research agenda. Um, one question just, and so this is, we're really at the end of time. We try to keep these to about an hour, but we did want to um, ask this question, which um, we're, you know, super interested in as well. Um, whether any of the sources that you looked at, the friendship albums, the moving panoramas, or any of the kind of visual sources that you looked at, um, provide insight into African Americans' geographic imagination, particularly with relationship to moving into uh, Northwest territories, into areas of Native American settlement. What, what do you see, if anything, in your sources about kind of these relationships and, and the kind of idea of geography and, and settle, settlement of North America? So I actually only encountered one image and one very explicit reference to um, African Americans thinking very expansively within the United States about, um, about Native American land. And that was actually in one of the Friendship Albums. There's a, an image by, uh, it's another watercolor painting by F Robert Douglas Jr. And he's depicting a, uh, a steamboat on a river. And in the image also is a Native American man. And so there's, there's this grappling with the, uh, the forcible expulsion of Native Americans from various parts of what is now the Southeast United States. But by and large, the African Americans that I, um, the activists that I write about, they don't, they don't really grapple with this, um, with this problem, with this issue. They mostly look expansive, like outside of the United States. Um, if, if we're looking at one of my chapters that uh, deals with the Fugitive Slave Act, and the moving panoramas, there's this imaginary of Canada as this place of absolute freedom. Um, if we think about the kinds of experiences of Marianne Shad Carey and Henry Bibb and many other individuals who moved to Canada or Canada West, right, there is a, um, a profound and sort of sobering experience that Black people have there. And it's not quite the, the land of, of absolute freedom and 
of opportunity that many of them expect, right? There isn't this kind of ideal uh, land of, of freedom, you know, you know uh, free from discrimination, racial discrimination or otherwise. But also we see that African Americans are looking expansively. They're looking to, to Haiti, they're looking to Liberia as uh, places of promise, not necessarily places to live, although some activists advocate this, but they're really models for what could be possible, right? What kinds of rights are available? Land ownership, uh, freedom from slavery, um, uh, the ability to vote, the ability to hold elected office, the ability to, to become a president or a senator. As um, you can see from the cover of my book, right? This is Edward James Roy, who is a senator at the time that Augustus Washington captures this daguerreotype. Um, in 1856 or maybe early 1857, and then he becomes the president of Liberia, right? So, so African Americans are, are thinking expansively about what is possible abroad and trying to, to mirror that, to bring that ideal hope um, to, to our shores, right, to, to the United States. But they don't really, uh, the, the sources that I've encountered haven't really dealt with um, Native American uh, expulsion of from their lands uh, so much, but there is there is some material there that that remains. Yes. All right. I wonder if I could uh, ask you one last uh, question. We're basically at our time, but we have one last question that I want to put forward to you that I think is pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll uh, wrap up. And that is about the use of images abroad in the 1840s. And the question was a uh, you know essentially an empirical one. Um, how was it, um, how, how, how likely was it to be able to raise uh, substantial funds in Britain for the cause of abolition after British imperial abolition? In other words, do you know if that remained an important uh, source of fundraising? I know it was definitely um, one of the motivating factors for William Wells Brown to go to, the, to, go to Britain. Um, at, the end of his uh, pamphlet that he publishes about his moving panorama of slavery, he publishes the names of, I think it's 27 women in various cities and towns in Britain who are collecting funds to send, um, uh, to send those funds to anti-slavery societies in the United States, right? So there's a kind of fundraising by proxy in, in Britain that would then benefit those in uh, those anti-slavery societies in the US and then presumably to, to fund their activities and perhaps even purchase the freedom of enslaved people in, in the United States. So there's actually quite a lot of, of fundraising that goes on. And we see this especially too in the, the 30s, 40s, and 50s when um, Ellen, Ellen and William Craft go to Britain and they go on these, uh, these, these uh, circuits, right? These speech, speech tours um, whereby they raise funds and send money home right, to, to fund the anti-slavery cause. They also pay for their own livelihoods, but there are um, about a dozen African-American speakers, right, elocutionists, men and women, formerly enslaved and born free, who go to the British Isles, right? Most of these are formerly enslaved people who tell their stories of slavery and they raise funds in order to support the anti-slavery cause. So there's, there's quite a lot that's happening even until the 1850s and uh, there are a couple of really great websites that document this, uh, this, this movement of individuals. And there are primary sources that are, um, that are uh, placed. I'm trying to think there's like an interactive map. I believe the website is Frederick Douglass in Britain. And it's more than just Frederick Douglass, but uh, there are uh, primary sources. There are newspapers that are linked to um, these, these uh, nightly speeches that the crafts and uh, William Wells Brown and Frederick Douglass Jr. and uh, many, many other uh, formerly enslaved people uh, give with the speeches that they give in order to raise funds and spread awareness and create political pressure on um, the United States. Yeah. Thank you, Aston. So uh, we're going to wrap up, but I just want to thank you so much for talking with us about your book. I see you have a really nice um, picture of it right next to you. Uh, Visualizing Equality, African-American Rights and Visual Culture in uh, the 19th Century, published by University of North Carolina Press just now in uh, fall 2020. So if you liked what you heard here, go, go get a copy of Aston's book. Um, and I just put in the chat window, Cecily Zander, first let me thank Cecily Zander and Matt Isham who are 
always helping us with the technical uh, technological side of these um, events. Matt Isham is the managing editor of the journal, and Cecily Zander is a PhD candidate at Penn State University, and we couldn't do this without them. I just put in the chat a link to Muster where we have um, a list of the upcoming webinars. And again, our next one is going to be on October 30th. Uh, that's a Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's where we're doing a roundtable on 19th century governor's paper. So real focus on archives and um, what the people at those really innovative projects are finding. So we hope you all are, will join us. And uh, thanks again, Aston, for being with us today. Thank you so much. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you. It was really a delight.